too broad. Sword.
Good morning. Let's go ahead and stand. Let's turn it over.
We did good. We did good. Uh, our retreat next year will be the same weekend as this year. I hope you're both. Uh, we had a great time. We had 35 adults, and it seemed like we had 35 kids also. No, they were good. We just really, really had a good time. And, you know, it was very good. And by the way, our next Sunday when we meet, it'll be out at Mountain View Park, which is on the Orchard. Um, we'll start at 10 o'clock, and we'll have a really good time there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is our text this morning. After we uh, read the scripture, we're going to have Charles and Sharon will sing. So let's stand together. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Begin with verse 18. 1 Corinthians 3 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of all, all the wise that they are in vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul, Paulus, Sidus, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. That's right. Father, we thank you this morning we come together to worship, to praise. Now we need to listen and to hear and let the Holy Spirit speak to us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
think about that, how much have we sacrificed for the Lord? A lot of the things we do is just, you know, we just do it, but uh, have we really sacrificed? Thank you for that song. Well, continuing our study here in 1 Corinthians, Paul is dealing with the church here that there's disunity and he's trying to bring the church together, show them the right kinds of things as a church, as Christians, as believers in Christ, they need to do. And so he has a solution here. He says you have to have proper thinking, a proper view of how things are supposed to be. In order to maintain unity in the church, we've got to have a proper view of ourselves, view of others, view of our possessions, view of our possessor. That's what we want to look at this morning. Because doing these things will cause us, as a church and as believers, to grow stronger. And uh, that's what God would have us to do. So we first of all look at, look at the proper view of ourselves. There in verse 18, verse, uh, through verse 20, but let's look at verse 18. He said, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he might be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. He did something that we are, we as men are impressed with our own wisdom. Many of the problems in a church or elsewhere could be solved if individuals were not so impressed with their own wisdom. We've got the answers. We know how to do it. We can get it all taken care of. But the scripture here, I think, indicates to us someone who thinks he is wise in this age is really deceiving himself. And he even uses the word fool. What does he mean that we ought to become a fool? Well, that's recognizing human wisdom without God is foolishness. Recognizing human wisdom without God is foolishness. That word foolish comes from the Greek root word moron. <laughs> Human wisdom is nothing than moronic. And it means before God. We need to put God in what we're trying to accomplish, what we're thinking about, what we are trying to do. Now Paul is not talking about math and science and business and mechanics, but he's talking about spiritual truth. Spiritual truth. We can be knowledgeable about a lot of secular things without having any special enlightenment from God. I mean, people are doing it all the time. You see all of the technologies and all of the accomplishments and all the things that people are doing. A lot of brilliant men and women who do not even know God. But in their own, they can get some things done. You see that? But human wisdom has no way of discovering or really understanding the divine things. As we said, man can be totally brilliant and discover and recreate and put together all of these kinds of things and not even know God. He can do that. Even we Christians, we don't have the right to, to our own opinions about God's revelation. Sometimes Christians will get together and sit around the table, the coffee table, and start discussing what do they think about this and what do they think about God and what do they think about all these kinds of things. We need to understand that God's word says one thing. That's what we need to understand and apply. That's what we need to use in our life to guide and direct us uh, in the things that we are trying to do. Because when Christians start expressing and following their own ideas about the gospel, about the church, about Christian living, that's when the church becomes divided. Because each one of us, in our own thinking and our own wisdom, we've got opinions, and when we get together with others, we're going to start arguing. We're going to say, that's not right, that's not the way it should be, and so forth. Even about what God is doing, even about revelation, even about all kinds of uh, theologies and doctrines, we will argue about it. And that's not what God wants within His church. God's Word says one thing, and we need to understand what it says. So the first step in becoming wise is recognizing human wisdom is foolish. And it's really a reflection of this world. Because that's where we get a lot of our ideas from. From the world and from the things that we've been taught since, since young and going into grade school and middle school and high school and college. And we learn all of these kinds of things from the news media and so forth. And that's what we use to determine what we think. And he said, this kind of wisdom is foolishness before God. 
You see, the church must create an atmosphere, must create an atmosphere in which God's word is honored. God's word is submitted. Human wisdom, human opinion cannot and is never used to judge or to qualify God's word. And that's what we try to do. Through the course of Christianity, through the course of the years, man has taken God's word and he has changed it to fit his own wants, his own thoughts, his own desire. And consequently, we have a church today that is sub where God would have us to be. And, and, and very immature and doing its own kind of things. Too many churches today are, are surrounded around social ideas and social things and trying to please people so that they can get more people here. We need to be teaching God's Word as it is. We need to be sharing the Word of God just as He would have us to do and let the Holy Spirit convict the hearts of those that are there so that they will be serving and doing what God wants them to do. Common commitment to the Word of God is why we serve and why we worship together. What happens when somebody doesn't teach Scripture? Well, he begins teaching his own ideas, his own opinions, and that's certainly going to divide people. If, we're to te if we strongly teach the Word of God and are truly teaching God's Word as it is, how are you going to go against that? The only way you do that is by trying to have your own opinion about it. And, as we said, it divides. You know, there are people who are not happy until, until they can express their opinion or criticize, be critical of what you're saying, what you're thinking. They're not happy until they can do that. The whole time you're talking, the whole time you're saying something, they're already thinking about how they can oppose that or how they can say something a little bit different. And so then they teach their own ideas and opinion, and again, that divides. I'll tell you what. Where God's word is concerned, we better leave it alone. We better just take the way that, that, that it is. There's an error proper that goes like this. Now listen carefully because it kind of jumps back and forth here. But he who knows not and knows not that he knows not is a fool. Shut him. But he who knows not and knows not that he knows not is simple. Teach him. That makes sense. I mean, if we think that we know everything that there is, how can we be taught? But if we realize that God has left us here to continue to learn more about Him and how He works, we can learn. We can sit and listen. We need to humble ourselves to be taught. I think sometimes we need to empty ourselves to be filled. As we come to church on Sunday morning or a Bible study or any time we're going to get into God's Word, I think we just need to simply humble ourselves and, and just say, God, Fill me with your word and thoughts, what you want in my life. Many of our Bible colleges and seminaries today are infiltrated with men who consider themselves wise and they're tearing apart the scriptures. We got a problem with some of these students that are coming out of our Bible colleges and the, and the seminaries and because they've been taught by men who are trying to give their own opinion of what God's word says and then they take it and, and need to go a little further with it. Continue looking at verse 19 again. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. <laughs> they hang themselves. They hang themselves. <laughs> Assuming that they are getting to God with their own wisdom, they are not doing it at all. And they cause themselves problems, difficulties. Verse 20. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, but they are vain. The, the reasoning of these folks is useless. Human philosophy cannot bring a man to God. It cannot happen. It's got to be the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's got to be of what God is trying to get to us. And man has simply got to humble himself before God and say, God, I don't know. Fill me. Teach me. Show me. Train me. Build me. Those kinds of things have to happen. This man here is not sure where he stands spiritually. He doesn't know. He doesn't understand. So we've got to have a proper view of ourselves. Apart from divine truth, we are but fools with empty thoughts. 
I think as we go through the day, whether you're at work or, or whatever you might be doing, you need to talk to God and let Him speak to you as you're doing or trying to accomplish that thing that you're doing. Let God lead you. Well, the second way we strengthen our church is we have the proper view of others. Verse 21, 22. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas. You know, even Paul said, we were not to elevate men or have special loyalty to men, but he mentions three. So what Paul is saying here, there can be men that can help you, teach you, and be a blessing. God sends men to churches, and when he does that, we need to listen. We need to hear. Uh, I appreciate men like Don Anderson, who was just up here. We have a Bible study with him, and, and he shares things to us that, you know, it really enlightens, it encourages, it strengthens, it helps us understand where we're at in our Bible study. God has used him and continues to use him. There are teachers that God has gifted and they are sent by God. We have men in our Sunday school classes who are teaching the Word of God. They take God's Word and they share it with you as God has led them to. We're to honor those who are teaching God's Word. Not because of the man that he is, but because he is teaching God's Word. And it doesn't matter necessarily his style or his motivational skills or being an organizer or personality, that's not what it's all about. Is he truthfully, honestly, sincerely opening up the Word of God and teaching it as God would have it to be taught? That's what it's all about. Hebrews chapter 13 tells us that we need to submit to spiritual leaders only though if they are faithful to God's Word in two ways. If they are faithful to God's Word in their teaching, makes sense. But secondly, in the way they live their life. If that teacher stands before you and shares something with you and they don't live it, it's not right. But if they share something to, uh, to you and for you uh, as for your part of life and that's how they live their life, then God will honor that. Teaching and living. This church in Corinth was very fortunate. Had three outstanding teachers of God's word. You had Paul the Apostle, you had Apollos as their pastor, and you had Peter who indirectly taught them. Wow, that's fantastic. Look at this church. And you got Paul who comes in and puts the church together, and you got Apollos who's pastoring them, and you got Peter who works with them, whether it be during Bible studies or whatever it might be. But you've got all three of them here. This church is blessed. I think we have what, six former or retired pastors in our church. We got other men and women who are, are very gifted in sharing the word of God. We're blessed. We are blessed. And we need to use them. We need to allow them to be uh, those who are going to instruct us and teach us and lead us. And then we look at their lives and they're living what they teach. Praise God for that. You need to be thankful for that. And we also have the opportunity, I mean, because of um, radio, television, books, conferences, and so forth, that there are a lot of men who God has uh, ordained, called, to use, blessed, and, and they, they teach, and we can listen to them. But please, be careful. You've got some of those on television, they do not live what they teach. They may be teaching what they do. They think God's word says, but if they're not living their life like that, be careful. Be careful. They must be used God's word. Be uniters in what they are teaching. And I think our first responsibility today, we kind of got away from this somewhat, but our first responsibility is to the local church. If God has called you to be a part of this church, then, then consider it the place that you come to, to be taught, to help others, to encourage others, to be a servant. And so God wants to build the local church. Jesus died for the church. And there are going to be others who come to, to teach us. I mean, we've had different speakers come in. We've had those who have come to uh, 
uh, share with us, and that's okay. But our first responsibility is to hear, and to those uh, in, within Fremont County, if you will, that's what we need to be doing. For all things are yours, whether Paul, Paul, or Peter, I have given him them to you to inspire, to, to inspire or impart spiritual wisdom, God says. All right, the third thing. Next, we need to have the proper view of possessions. This is interesting. Look at verse 22, the latter part. He says, whether Paul or Paul or says. Then he says, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. Pretty clear. I mean, it's pretty clear right there. The third responsibility or requirement for a church to grow even stronger is for all of us to have the right view of our possessions. What has God given you? And it is God who has given it to you. Have the proper view of your possessions. I mean, they're going to be godly teachers, but there are things listed that belong to us. They're already part of us. The first one he says is this world. Wait a minute. This world belongs to us? Well, we understand from Scripture that right now it is in the grips of the evil one, Satan. I mean, he's got a lot of control, and we see that every day by the things that are going on, by the immorality and all those kinds of things. But one of these days, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, will take that title deed that he's got from this, take it away from Satan, and he will be, Satan will be removed permanently, as well as all of the demons, the evil, the sin, the sickness, and Christ will reign. But listen, the Bible says that you and I will join heirs, we will reign with him. We will get to reign with him. And this world is mine when it is set up in the millennial kingdom stage. That's ours. That is our possession. Not until the sin and so forth is removed, but it is ours. But I think even today, we can appreciate this world more than even an unbeliever can. You saw the pictures of our, the retreat and the, the beauty that was up there. Um, my son, who just moved back here from Germany, was up there on the retreat, and he said, you know, we need to cut down those trees right there, the tops at least, so we can see the mountain view out there, the beauty of it all. It's glorious, just hiking up there and so forth. And God gave that to us. We know its creator, the one who sustains this earth, the one who perfects us, the one who provides the air for us, the water for us, the food, all of that. We understand that. The unbeliever doesn't. I mean, he thinks about global warming and he thinks about all of these other evolution and this is how it was. Hogwash. God put it together. God sustains it. God supplies we will not run out of stuff as long as we're here. God's taking care of it for us. That's part of our possession. Secondly, he says there, all life is ours. Hallelujah, in Christ we have a new life. Not only that do we have this new life, but he says you have it more abundantly. We can enjoy, we can appreciate our life more than an unbeliever because we know what it's all about. We have a gift from God. He says you can have joy, you can have peace, you can have comfort, you can have excitement from this life, regardless of what's going on, because you have the Holy Spirit living in you. Another possession that we have. A third one he talks about there is even death is ours. One of the greatest enemies of mankind has been overcome by Christ. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. And because of that, you and I have also conquered death. We have conquered the grave. Yeah, we're going to pass through death, but if not as a slave, the grave cannot hold me. Because of what Jesus did, he said we too will be with him. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You know, all that death can do, there's only one thing that death can do for a believer, is deliver us to Jesus. Oh, isn't that great? Deliver us to Jesus. Shirley Mead passed away a couple of weeks ago, but as she died, she had a smile on her face. She was being delivered to her Jesus, to our Jesus. That's all death can do. So whether we live or we die as believers, we can't lose. God has blessed us. God has gifted us. 
And as long as we're here, he says, stay there. I want you to stay there and finish the work that I've given you to do. But when it's time, I'm just going to take you home. i got a place prepared just for you. Well, he also says there, things present to us. Everything that we experience in this life. I mean, there's going to be good and bad. There's going to be present and painful, joy, disappointments, health and sickness, contentment, grief, all of those things. But we are in God's hands. And all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. So whatever you're going through, whatever happens in your life, whatever ups or downs are there, we are in the hands of God. And nothing separates us from the love of God. Nothing. We belong to Him. Then the next thing He says, there are things to come our hearts. Heavenly blessings. And we only have a glimpse now. But there are blessings coming to us. They're going to be some of the greatest blessings that you'll ever think about. I mean, God has blessed us, and we thank you for that. And when we bow before our meal, or, or just during the times we say, God, thank you for this. Thank you how you have blessed me with my family, with, with the things that you have done for me here. But boy, wait till we get to heaven. You talk about shouting. You talk about raising your hands. You talk about running up and down those streets. Oh my. What a tremendous thing it's going to be. The last thing. The proper view of our possessors. Verse 23. In the year of Christ, and Christ is God. Our church, our life as believers can be strengthened if we realize and understand have the proper view of Christ. As a church, as a believer, if you take your eyes off of Christ, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. We belong to Him. And in turn, because of that, we belong to God. We are His. And so our church can, our church can continue to grow and strengthen if we realize that of a lack of wisdom without Him, that if we respect those who rightfully teach the Word of God, realize that they are gifts that God has sent to us. And if we understand the possessions we have are because of Him. But I like that last one. We must keep our eyes on Him. We must keep our eyes on Him. What a message of unity. Without His wisdom, His gifts, His Son, what do we have? The only reason we're here is because of Jesus Christ. The only reason we're here is because of God's love, mercy, and grace and what He gave to us, what we possess. So as we come together and we worship, we serve, we love, we praise, we need to do it together as the body of Christ, as children of God, as those who He has paid the price for, and leads and guides and directs us. As the song said earlier, can we do what Jesus did? Can we sacrifice for Him? Analyze in your own personal life. What have you sacrificed for the glory of God? What have you sacrificed? Let's pray. Father, we come this morning and we thank you for the message that we have here in First Corinthians. Paul was speaking to this church who was scattered in many ways. Uh, they thought very highly of themselves. They thought of themselves as very intelligent, full of wisdom. But he needed for them to understand it's only because of you that we have what we have. Same today. We, we are in such an advanced time of life. There are so many things going on that are just tremendous, fantastic. And with man's wisdom, a lot of it has been done. But as believers in you, we need to have that proper view. Oh God, help us to do that this morning. Let us realize the price that you paid and what you're simply asking us to do. And that's be obedient. Let's all stand together. We're going to simply sing, Just as I am. That's what the message is all about. Just as you are. What does God want you to do? You're going to come and go and help. You can meet with you here if you've got a question. Let's stand.
and uh, there are some instructions on their leaflet that you have in your bulletin to tell you that. Hillary DeVoe, would you come forward, please? Come on. Hillary, Hillary is the one that's been putting up all the things up on the screen um, for the last several years. But she is leaving us. She's moving to Wyoming. Her parents, Toby, and Amy, you guys come too. We really appreciate Hillary and all that she's done. She grew up here kind of in, through the high school years and uh, just been a real blessing. And then we have students moving to Cody, Wyoming this week and we can pray for them as they move there, find a new church and so forth. We're going to have a word of prayer that I could just come by and give her a hug. Amy, we really, uh, Hillary, we really appreciate all that you've done. We do too, Amy. We appreciate you too. <laughs> but Hillary, we appreciate that uh, you've been so faithful. Just getting all that up there for us. And thank you. Thank you very much. Who would ask Bob if he'd come and dismiss us for prayer? And come by and just shake hands and give him a hug. We live in an upside down world. The world is trying to make that which is important and real and true wrong and insignificant. And that which is immaterial and insignificant trying to make it important. Did you ever notice that God gave us people? and things, people to love and things to use, but the world wants us to turn that around and give us people to use and things to love. That's not the way it should be. We are to love one another. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, your grace, your love, and especially the people that you have in our paths. Father, we are thankful for each and every one that you have gifted us with. And we ask, Lord, as we go from this place, we would be more than ever aware of those around us, those people that we are to touch, those people that we are to speak to, those people that we are to love. And Father, we thank you for Hillary and family. Lord, each one has been a special blessing in special ways. And Lord, we ask that you would prepare the way as they go from this place to them. the church that you have selected for them, the place of service that you have selected for them. And Lord, we ask that all things will be done according to your perfect will. And we will be careful to give you praise and the glory for it all. For it's in Jesus' blessed name we ask you. And all God's people said, Amen.